Shabbat Shalom. Some of you may know, some of you don't know, that I've been practicing yoga for a good deal of my life, probably nearly 15 years. And one day, I ended up in the kind of class that I normally try not to go to, one of the classes where there's a lot of chanting. I avoid chanting on the whole because I find that it's inconsistent with my own Jewish practice to be chanting names from other traditions. No lack of respect for those other traditions, but it's not where I belong. Nonetheless, I turned right instead of left, and I ended up in a class of about 150 people where there was a good half an hour of chanting to begin the class. And then the teacher invited all of these 150 people to start moving on their mats to the chant while it was going on, and people did. And I remember looking around and wondering how many of those people who were moving their bodies in really what looked like ecstatic motions to these this liturgy from another tradition, I remember asking myself, I wonder how many of you are Jewish? And I wonder how many of you, if you weren't presently dancing and breathing and praying, because this is obviously what you were doing, I wonder how many of you would tell me that you would never come to a synagogue because it's the last place in the world that you would come to pray. And yet, there they were. They, they were obviously, and it was, a very spiritual feeling, even though I wasn't personally participating. The sound of their voices, the movement of their bodies, the feeling of everybody being together, it was very spiritual. It was very transcendent. And I've often asked myself whether once upon a time our own spirituality was more physical. And that somehow, over the years, we just lost that habit. If you take what we do in synagogue, we, well, we come in and obviously we sit down. That's the first thing we do. Then periodically we stand up and sit down and stand up and sit down again. But those movements in the Amida, the walking backwards, the walking forwards, the bowing, are the remnant, perhaps, of a more expressive physical, spiritual tradition back in the day. Because we read in the Talmud of Rabbi Akiva, who would begin his personal prayers in one corner of the room, and by the time he'd finished, he'd be in the other corner of the room entirely, because he'd have been carried there by the spontaneous movement of his entire body as he used it to express his prayers. There's a midrash, one of my favorite midrashim, that the phrase kol haneshama tahalelyah, which is at the end of Psalm 150, should really be read kol haneshima tahalelyah, that every neshima, every breath, every inhalation should be an individual prayer to God. And that sits very well with traditions like meditation and yoga and indeed any other kind of practice that is focused on the breath. And so I wonder whether once upon a time we were more, let me call it, spiritually embodied than we are now. Because it's not that we don't care for our bodies today. We have diets and we have vitamins and we have workouts and triathlons and chiropractor sessions and so on and so forth. But I wonder if with all of that, nonetheless, we have fallen out of touch with the fact that that is also, that our body is a very eloquent instrument for the true expression of our spiritual reality. And it's in that light that I read the part of this week's Torah portion that talks about somebody called the Nazir. And the word nazir means separated, nazirut, yeah? It comes to, be the, um, comes to be the modern Hebrew word for Christian clergy, actually, nazirin. Nazir means somebody who is deliberately taking themselves out of the run of the community. But the word nazir also has a second meaning. It means a crown. 
It means a precious jewel, or in a word that Harry Potter has now brought back into the language, and it's a nice word, a diadem. And from the outset, the terminology of Nazirut, of being a Nazir, seems to be suggesting that this is somebody who is trying in some way, who is striving to be exceptional. A Nazir, unusually in a patriarchal tradition, could be a man or a woman. And they would take upon themselves the practice of elevating their kedusha, of becoming more holy, or, as we might see it, putting themselves on a spiritual journey. And the external signals of this were first that they let their hair grow long and untrimmed, and the second was that they abstained not only from wine, but also from any product at all made of grapes or the derivatives of grapes, and both of those are interesting. Because if you are going to set yourself apart spiritually, why those two particular things out of everything that you could do? We know from the Song of Deborah that there used to be an idiom in ancient Hebrew when hair grew long in Israel. And that idiom means when people set themselves the task of becoming heroes. And the tradition was that if somebody decided to go on a quest, whatever kind of quest, they would signal to other people that they were on a quest by growing their hair. And they would, they would leave their hair uncut for the period of the quest. And after the quest was over, after they had achieved what they'd set out to do, they would cut their hair off. And to leave one's hair ungrown, as anybody with hair like mine knows, suggests a deliberate relinquishing of trying to manage the course of nature. A deliberate not trying to govern what is inherently ungovernable. It's a containing of your power to manage what is external in order to be able to turn your power inward. It's a way of freeing us up to consider what is deeper, what is internal. And indeed, I have not one but two friends in rabbinical school, in rabbinical school who grew their hair. One arrived at rabbinical school with a full head of dreadlocks, and the other grew his hair initially as an act of solidarity for a friend of ours who was sick, but then the growing of his hair now became part of his quest, part of his developing himself into a rabbi. They both, by the way, finished their quest. They both have short hair now. And as for abstaining from wine, well, wine marks the transition from ordinary time into holy time and back again. We have wine at Brit Milah. We have wine under the chuppah at weddings. We have wine at Kiddush for every festival. We have wine at Havdalah. Everywhere you look, everywhere that time shifts, Borepari Hagafen, that blessing, will be part of that ritual. So by abstaining from anything to do with grapes, a Nazir will have taken themselves out of the cycle of Jewish time, letting days and weeks and months blur into each other. And again, the removal from time and the removal of the course of nature, both of those are a way of turning one's energy inwards. And it seems that becoming a Nazir, I mentioned this before at the introduction to the Torah reading, remained very popular. It was so popular that even after the exile, when it wasn't possible to bring a sacrifice to end one's period of Nazirut, because of course there was no longer a temple to bring that sacrifice to, the practice nonetheless continued. Men and women would take it upon themselves either as a temporary or as a permanent practice. And we read in the Mishnah of Helen, Queen of Adiabin, I really hope I've pronounced that right, it was a Persian province, and she was a Nizira for a total period of 14 years, as well as being a queen, and making some fairly substantial donations to the Jewish community. Let me try to offer an explanation of why it is that that practice was sticky, why it is that becoming a Nazir is so compelling. And we might have imbibed the idea somewhere during our education that we have a body, 
but we also have a soul, right? There is, this, there is this transcendent little piece of a greater reality. We call it our soul. It lives inside our body. It outlasts our body. Our body dies, but the soul continues on. Maybe we learn that the soul goes somewhere else after we die. And maybe also we have taken in from other cultures the idea that the soul is somehow more perfect than the body, that the body is gross and inferior and physical and stumbles around bumping into things and getting into trouble, but the soul is ethereal and pure and wholly good and so on and so forth. But that is not the way that our tradition understands that relationship. The separation of soul from body is a Greek idea we didn't think of it, and I want to suggest that we shouldn't continue to think of the relationship between body and soul in that way. To get a truer idea of the relationship between body and soul, I need to tell you a little story that our rabbis invented many, many, actually many years ago. This story probably dates back to the first or second century. And it begins with, once upon a time, there was a king, and the king had a magnificent palace, and it was set in verdant gardens, and he loved all of his gardens. But the garden that he loved best, and the place that he most loved to go and sit in the afternoon when the sun was hot, was his orchard, which had tree after tree that bore the most delicious figs. And he loved the shade of the trees, and he loved the bird song. but what he loved best of all was a good fig. And he would wait, he would sit in the orchard, he would wait for the figs to ripen and for, the, and, 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 for, and for the first taste of that fig that was infused with the sun. But he was not the only person in his kingdom who enjoyed his figs. And so one day he decided that he would appoint guards over his orchard. And he chose one lame man and one blind man because he figured that the lame man would not be able to steal his figs not being able to walk, and the blind man would not be able to steal his figs because he couldn't see them. So one day, the lame man and the blind man were guarding the orchard, and the lame man said to the blind man, do you see, over there, there are some lovely figs. And the blind man said, what do you mean, do you see? And the lame man said, I really think that we should have a taste of those figs. And, and uh, but, what am I going to do? I can't walk. I can't go over there and get them. Aha, said the blind man. I have an idea. I think that you should climb up on my shoulders and tell me where to go. And if you do that, then we'll be able to pick the figs. And they did. They went, uh, the, the lame man climbed up on the blind man's shoulders, the, told the blind man where to go, and off they went. And they picked the orchard entirely clean of the royal figs. And at some point afterwards, there they sat under the trees, very full, very happy. They were very good figs. And of course, at this point in the story, the king comes back, he notices that the trees are bare, he calls the guards, and he says, where are my figs? And the lame man says, well, I didn't exactly walk over and get them, did I? And the blind man says, you really think that I could see to pick figs? But the king in the story is smart. And he takes the lame man, he puts him on the blind man's shoulders and he sentences them both together. And they go to prison for a very long time. And our rabbis teach that this is a parable for the relationship that the soul has with the body. The king, of course, is God, who is not going to be fooled by us saying, oh, it, what, uh, by the soul saying, oh, no, it wasn't me. I didn't want to do anything wrong. But that body, it just trundled over there, and the next thing I knew, <laughs> you know, or the body saying, well, I can't do anything without being motivated by the soul, so you should blame the soul and not me. Our tradition understands that body and soul belong together. Body and soul are an indivisible unit. And if that is the case, going back to the yoga class that I mentioned at the beginning, if that is the case, I wonder if it might be time for us to re-evaluate what happens 
When we engage in our various physical disciplines, when we go to yoga or when we run or when we cycle or when we go to a dance class, I wonder if it's not open to us to understand that that also is a very direct, very visceral expression of our spirituality and a connection to something that is bigger than us. And indeed, there are rabbis in our time who are writing about this. Rabbi Jacob Herber is a competitive cyclist. And he writes, I'm quoting, most importantly, I have had some of the most intense spiritual experiences while riding my bike. Whether it is competing in a race and feeling the adrenaline flow through my body as I sprint to the finish line, or struggling up a steep grade after spending 75 miles in the saddle and feeling the lactic acid burn in my legs and the endorphins running through my system, I feel God's presence. I wonder if it could even happen in baseball. Not that us English people understand much about baseball, but still. And perhaps then the lesson of the Nazir is that it's not only exercise which can afford us the opportunity of reuniting our body and our soul. Perhaps if we're not exercisers, it's the use of our body in performing mitzvot, when we go to work in a food pantry, when we help our parents, when we find a time and a place maybe to withdraw a little so that we can gain our fuller perspective. And so I invite us in this week of the Nazir to begin to consider how we embody our spirituality. How are each of you, how are we going to use our bodies and our breath and our energy to take ourselves one step further forward on our spiritual journeys. Because you see, in the end, the journey of the body is the same journey as the journey of the soul. Shabbat Shalom.